We'll get started now. Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Bobby Wilding. I'm the Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York, and I just want to welcome you uh, to the second in our new monthly webinar series for 2022. This month we are focusing on intersections, race, and environmental policy, and we have three great speakers to talk tonight. The panel and discussion is going to be moderated by Paul Webster, our Director of Programs. And in just a moment, I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to him. But I just want to share for folks who aren't familiar with us, Clean and Healthy New York's mission is to build a just and healthy society in which toxic chemicals are simply unthinkable. And we work through changing laws, shifting marketplaces, and empowering people to affect change. And we're really pleased to have you all joining us today. And uh, so at the end, we'll be sharing some ways that you can take action. But in the meantime, I wanna turn it over to Paul Webster to moderate this panel. Thanks again. Hello, and thank you, um, Bobby. And welcome everyone to our panel this month. Uh, intersections, race, and environmental policy, and we'll be having reflections on environmental racism and the work to build a just and healthy future here in New York. And our guests uh, tonight, I will uh, introduce them all right now, and then they'll introduce themselves as we get into the program. Our first speaker is going to be Sophia Long's work and clean and healthy New York's new campaigns manager, followed by Aaron Mayer, Sierra Club board member, Ad and who works for the Adirondack Council, and who's their forever Adirondacks director, and Willie Terry, a trustee of the Troy Area Labor Council and member of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. As Bobby mentioned earlier, my name is Paul Webster. I'm the program director for Clean and Healthy New York. And we're so glad to have you here tonight as a part of our Black History Month uh, program uh, for our monthly webinar uh, series. And uh, we're you know, gonna talk about the race and environmental policy and why it's so important uh, here in New York and elsewhere. Uh, because of the long history that we've had with environmental justice in uh, the United States. And that goes back to the days of slavery when slaves in the Deep South were left on the plantation or left in the swamps and on the islands during the hot, humid, uh, and, and dangerous uh, months of the summer when uh, mosquitoes that carried disease uh, affected them, but um, the plantation owners and others would generally leave and go to the north or to the Europe or elsewhere to avoid having to deal with the disease and uh, the mosquitoes. And that's carried into the civil rights movement, which uh, Aaron and Willie will talk about a little bit in talk terms of how during um, the civil rights movement, environmental justice was an, a very important part. And in fact, um, Dr. Martin Luther King died during an environmental protest, a labor protest about the working and environmental conditions faced by black sanitation workers in Tennessee. And then also as the environmental uh, movement amongst people of color in the United States has sparked, you have uh, the, the protests that were started by Cesar Chavez and uh, Latino uh, uh, farm workers who were protesting uh, the use of pesticides on the farms. And then uh, students in Houston, black students in the late 1960s uh, protesting uh, injustices in their communities as it related to the siting of a landfill. And then the protests, protests here in New York, in Harlem in the late 60s and 70s, uh, protesting the, the North River Waste Treatment Facility on the west side of Manhattan. 
And then it goes on and on in Buffalo with lead poisoning, in Syracuse with the siding and uh, the, the air, uh, poor air quality around I-81. Here in Albany in the capital region, fights that Aaron Mayer, one of our speakers tonight, has led for many years and on and on with the injustices going on in Newburgh, New York, in that um, heavily uh, black populated city um, with PFAS and uh, lead poisoning, and then out to even Yapank, New York, in Suffolk County, where the community right now is protesting a waste treatment facility. So New York State and our nation has had a history of the intersection of race and environmental uh, justice. So we're here to talk about tonight some of those injustices, but also how we are advocating and working to correct those wrongs and to talk with some of the leaders who are involved in that. And with that, we're gonna have our first speaker tonight, uh, Sophia Longsworth, who is our new uh, campaigns manager here at Clean and Healthy New York. And Sophia, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Paul. Good evening, everyone. I am Sophia Longsworth. I'm the new campaign manager here at Clean and Healthy New York, as Paul mentioned. I'm very excited for our discussion tonight as we celebrate Black History Month and focus on environmental issues impacting Black communities here in New York. So for those of you who are not familiar with some of the terminology we will be mentioning this evening, I just want to give a brief overview of some of these terms. So pertinent to tonight's discussion is environmental racism. And this refers to systemic disparities in environmental policies and practices impacting communities of color. This ranges from laws and regulations to physical structures that negatively affect the environment as well as the health of the people living within these communities. This leads to an environmental injustice as the impacts of these poor environmental practices are disproportionately felt by low-income communities and communities of color. The significance of these is that there are cumulative impacts of simultaneous environmental injustices negatively impacting the overall health of the people within these communities. New York State has a well-documented history of environmental injustices, whereby communities of color and low-income communities were and still are subjected to polluted environments in the places where they live, work, and go to school. Some of these injustices include the Love Canal tragedy of the 1970s in Niagara Falls, New York, where a community was built near to a former dump site for toxic chemicals. These chemicals eventually leached into the ground and toxic fumes filled the air. The impacts were evident by an increase in women having miscarriages and stillbirths, children with birth defects and various cancer diagnoses. Some of you who are familiar with the Love Canal story may know more about the protest group led by Lois Gibbs. However, there was another organization called the Concerned Love Canal Renters Association run by activist Eileen Thornton, consisting of mostly African-American residents, but this group did not get as much media coverage as their white housewife neighbors. The result of this disaster was the development of the Superfund program, officially known as CERCLA, or the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, which is intended to clean up sites contaminated with hazardous waste. Nationally, communities of color and low-income communities are more likely to live near environmental, environmentally contaminated Superfund sites. Next slide, please. Thank you. So today, Black communities continue to face environmental injustice realities in their everyday lives, and I'll just mention a few. So starting with air pollution, naturally, naturally and nationally, <laughs> Black people breathe dirtier air due to pollution from construction, agriculture, vehicular emissions, power plants, and more by virtue of, these uh, by virtue of where these activities are implemented. Here in New York State, residential and commercial buildings use more fossil fuels than any other state, 
and there are more highways, parkways, and throughways near communities of color than any other state. In New York City, where neighborhoods and buildings are more condensed than outside of the city, diesel freight trains run along communities of color, for example, from Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn all the way to the end of Queens. Bus depots, rail yards, warehouses, and more are put in these communities where idling vehicles constantly release emissions resulting in respiratory illnesses like asthma. And just as an example, in the Bronx, um, this community has the highest asthma rate and respiratory hospitalizations in all of New York City, and also cardiovascular diseases and premature death. So this image here shows that people of color and mostly black people breathe in pollutants from gas combustion for residential heating and hot water at a higher rate than their other racial and ethnic counterparts. Next slide, please. So this one here shows that on a national scale, black people are more likely to breathe polluted air from construction, power plants, industrial, residential, and agricultural activity, and cars and trucks, more so than any other racial or ethnic group. Next slide, please. So now we'll look at lead poisoning, and Paul mentioned this a little bit. So again, here in New York State, we lead nationally with the highest number of children with lead poisoning. And this was demonstrated in 2017, where a third of children taking the mandatory tests showed positivity for lead poisoning. The disparity is greatest among children of color, predominantly Black and Latino children, especially in Buffalo, where compared to white neighborhoods, Black and Latino children are 12 times more likely to have lead poisoning. Lead in paint was outlawed in the 1970s, but a lack of proper remediation and renovation to homes means that this toxic paint is still in the homes where children's re children reside, resulting in damage to the brain and nervous system, lower IQs, slowing of growth and development, impacts to hearing and speech, and learning and behavioral problems. In adults, some of the effects include kidney and reproductive organ failure. And this prob problem still persists in communities in Newburgh and Syracuse, as Paul mentioned. So this image here shows that Black children are more likely to have higher blood lead levels than other groups. But just so you all know, and as a reminder for those of you who already know, there is no safe blood lead level. Next slide, please. Lastly, we'll look at waste management. Since the closure of the Fresh Kills landfill in Staten Island in 2001, New York City no longer had a reliable resting ground for its waste. It then began seeking solutions in states nearby as well as upstate New York. However, before the tons of garbage could be exported out of the city, it first had to pass through waste transfer stations that were installed in neighborhoods where communities of color live. Apart from the aesthetic, the problem with waste transfer stations is the creation of noise pollution, foul odors, litter blown off these transfer trucks, the attraction of rodents and ver vermin, and of course the air pollution from the vehicles, making hundreds of daily trips to and from the waste transfer stations. So this image here shows the number of trips the transfer vehicles make daily throughout these communities of color. In Suffolk County's Brookhaven in Long Island, the NAACP is currently challenging a proposal to create yet another waste transfer station, which will hold up to 6,000 tons of garbage a day. So the number of trips here that we're seeing in this image throughout these communities of color bringing waste to the transfer stations um, highlights the South Bronx. And as I mentioned previously, the South Bronx currently has the highest rate of asthma in New York City. So now you can see why. Consider that on top of the garbage trucks driving through these neighborhoods, there are also bus depots with idling vehicles and warehouses where delivery vehicles are constantly making daily trips and other environmental ish justice issues afflicting these neighborhoods. So imagine what this looks and feels like for Black communities. 
Alan here, but like Bobby said at the beginning, at the end of the webinar, we'll let you know some ways that you can get involved with CHNY's um, activity. We like to take action towards a just society. So thank you. And Paul, you're up. Sophia, thank you so much for that uh, outstanding presentation about uh, all of the different uh, challenges that are facing our communities uh, across New York, especially our, our Black communities, and what we can do to organize, to identify, and to stand up and fight back against uh, some of these corporate giants and others who are putting us in a tough position uh, health-wise and are just impacting every aspect of what we do and how we live. And someone who can talk about uh, decades of experience in winning these fights and bringing truth to power is our next guest and speaker, uh, a member of the board of the Sierra Club and the first African-American uh, national president of the Sierra Club, uh, someone who has also recently gotten his honorary uh, PhD. I'd like to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Aaron Mayer. Aaron? Thank you, Paul. And uh, let me see if I can uh, share my screen and make sure I share the right screen. And uh, all right. Well, thank you, Paul. I mean, you made me feel like the old guy that I am. And, uh, but indeed it's an honor and privilege to be on the board of Clean and Healthy New York. Uh, I came through that in the wake of my brother, Cecil Corbin Mark, uh, who was a West Harlem environmental action. I remember the day he was hired. Uh, I remember our early, you know, chatting and, and sharing what he was in for, but a little bit about me. My name is Aaron Mayer. Uh, as Paul mentioned, I guess I'm very old in the movement, but yes, I'm one of the EJ pioneers before there was an environmental justice movement. The Toxic Waste and Race Study uh, was published in 1987. And in 1987, at that time, I was engaged, uh, beginning engagement in the battle against a solid waste incinerator uh, in my community. In fact, if you get a copy of the Toxic Waste, the original uh, Toxic Waste and Race Study, you'll see like the color color has like an orange dot on the capital of Albany. That dot is our solid waste incinerator battle. Uh, up until that point, as Paul had mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the incidents, even though there's been history of people of color living in the worst and degraded environments. In fact, if you ever look at some of the, uh, what they talk about, uh, the redlining districts, uh, always highlighted the worst properties, but also not only were the environmental risks, but race factored into defining what was a undesirable uh, area to live within any city. But even then with all those dots in that historic fact, and all that historic data, uh, we did not have the dots connected whereby you're linking race, environmental risk, uh, environmental policy uh, as it Im impacts on race or as race impacts on it. It wasn't until the uh, toxic waste and race study in Dr. led by Dr. Ben Chavis a uh, graduate student at that time was now Dr. Charles Lee and my sister, uh, uh, Bernice Miller Travis. These are your really early uh, pioneers, what I call the foundational pioneers and what would become the environmental justice movement. My brother, Dr. Bob Bullard, uh, they call him the father of environmental justice because he's done an excellent job in not only choreographing and writing the, 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 the background and recording all the actions that we were doing since the first uh, People of Color Summit, and capturing our histories and our stories and our narrative and creating the entire pedagogy around uh, environmental justice in the environmental justice movement and environmental racism and giving the theoretical framework, which we were developing on, on the ground, but which is now being taught in uh, everything from uh, political economics, economics, public policy uh, in political science, um, anthropology, uh, sociology degrees, law degrees in environmental policy, public health degrees in environmental environmental health disparities, in fact, your entire environmental health disparities comes out of this movement, this movement birthed a lot of 
pathways, but also has informed public policy, national policy, and international policy. Because in making that case for environmental justice, uh, we can see clearly uh, that there's been sacred. So where do I fit in it? Well, since uh, you know I was basically on the ground fighting the incinerator, uh, and as I say, there's a difference. I differentiate the class of actors and activists who are actually on the ground, the uh, intellectuals and scholars who are documenting and doing the analysis and actually coming up with the data to, that would ultimately define the movement and scholarship. And then there's, you know, uh, like I said, those who, who keep it going. So for me, uh, Bob, Bob Bullock calls himself the uh, father of the environmental movement or the George Washington of the movement. I consider myself the Alexander Hamilton of the movement, not only because I'm from New York, but because Alexander Hamilton was a great federalist, which is basically moving the movement from just one local revolution, but basically collecting and building it and connecting it to others. And so um, mine was basically not only to build power for our struggle at the local level, but also to build power by which, uh, you know, we would uh, connect with other movements to, as they say, to help emancipate and bring actually about just action and change uh, that, that would, uh, you know, at least help some of the poorest of our communities have the tools to fight. So mine was connecting, not only identifying the risk and threats of solid waste and solid waste sector, but then connecting it with the mainstream movement and to get power from that movement so that we could have power and organizing tools and moving forward. And I chose the Sierra Club as the means to do that. Why? Because that was where the money and the resources and the organization skill of fighting big environmental polluters and winning. And I saw that as a natural ally. I made my case to that organization uh, some 30 years ago. And uh, at the point of concluding, uh, uh, I was asked by that then uh, the Atlantic chapter, you know, if I solicited the, I, I, or I should solicit the help from the NAACP. So my first foray uh, in expanding and building allyship uh, was taken away because my race matters. So not only did we recognize that um, toxic race and race would be settled based upon places of race and where people of color are because they're poor, uh, disempowered, and have low political power, uh, that even at the point of activism, uh, my race mattered. And this is really critical because this is also borne out, as was mentioned earlier, with regards to the Love Canal struggle. Uh, again, uh, the state, in the case of Love Canal, it poured massive state government resources, human health studies, just like you saw the POF at PFOAS, right across the river in, in, in Rensselaer, how the state went in, did blood testing on the white population. But when it came to the Arbor Hill community and the black population, um, just like in Buffalo and Arbor Hill, uh, the government did not step in, did not do the human health studies, did not do the human risk studies, did not do the human impact analyses. And our communities, just like Buffalo uh, in the wake of Love Canal, while the black community was there left alone, we too were left alone. And again, that can't, be said enough. One of the things about environmental racism, it's not only just the institutional actors on behalf of government and policy and policymakers, it's our entire civil societies anchored in that history and legacy of racism. And it's not until we look at, as John Muir said, you know, anything in the universe and find it, everything is connected to it. It parallels, you know, Dr. King's point of the inescapable, inescapable mutuality of all humankind that what affects one people or community actually affects, affects us all. And so his struggle and ultimately his death while fighting for labor rights in uh, Memphis, Tennessee, which actually to this day is one of the most toxic uh, ridden communities with regards to uh, pesticides, as well as uh, uh, a host of other uh, uh, chemicals, farm related chemicals that were manufactured uh, right there in Memphis and right adjacent and adjoining to black communities. So Arbor Hill saw that historic connection. And I talked about the institution and, it, and the institution of racism and the perception. It, and again, this goes, as Paul mentioned, since, you know, the, you know, the founding of our nation, but more importantly, a critical piece of, of our culture uh, is anchored in notions of equality and inequality. And so one of the things that I found well, and was profoundly moved by the fact that early, even in the environmental movement, that there was this effort uh, to suggest that people of color uh, by uh, Joe LeConte, uh, not only being inferior stewards, uh, but more importantly, should not even be allowed to be stewards or of the land or public policy. In fact, as separate and uh, different species, we were not entitled to the same uh, protection. So he, as not only being one of the co-founders of the Sierra Club, 
He was one of the co-founders of a eugenics movement that profoundly shaped institutional racism and, and created and shaped scientific racism in the treatment of people of color throughout the United States. Why does this matter? Because it goes right to public policy and it goes right to who writes public policy, who gets the government, who gets the lead, who gets the power to say what happens, where it happens and how it happens. And one of the things that we had to do with this movement was not only shift the power uh, uh, to, to a fight a local incinerator, but also build power within the community and then build a movement so that, you know, the institutional arrangements that are against us that have been against us uh, since the, you know, since the founding of this nation and throughout its history, but more so within the modern 20th century with scientific racism, that we had to fight for and reclaim that place and space. And that is why the powerful, rich civil rights movement still informed the manner in which we engage to shift and change and build up, go about building and creating power. And that using that same power to not only to build a movement, but to shut down the incinerator, but also go beyond that movement. So one of the things that came out of the uh, Intoxic Waste and Race was the People of Color Summit. And the People of Color Summit was a diverse movement. It recognized that racism, uh, as well as uh, environmental pollution and environmental degradation, it did not care about uh, race, color, power, poverty, et cetera. It hits a lot of people. It really comes down to that elite 1% having the advantage to, as they say, uh, get the maximum benefits as society at the expense and health of those who are the poorest uh, and underserved in America. So finding those points of intersection and building a movement and coming and cutting across race, class, and caste was one of the things that I found that was very pivotal to my efforts and my struggle in building a movement. And so not only in just like linking and finding the linkages with regards to race and politics, but realizing that clearly one's economic status and one's economic conditions drive the vulnerable axes whereby they cite polluting facilities within our backyards. So they look at an area and say, well, what's its poverty status? What's the social economic status? Uh, what's its employment status? And one of the things that they always held out to, one of the common threads when it came to exploiting and taking advantage of people and citing polluting facilities in poor Black communities was poverty. And so the issue of the wage and the right of the wage, people are willing to do and live with a number of things if you tell them that you get a job. In fact, if you look at coal country right now, Joe Manchin, whose people are the poorest of the poor, for West Virginia in the United States, uh, with the worst of the worst health outcomes with regards to coal and being exposed to toxic coal dust, but yet they keep voting Republican. They keep voting for a policy and politicians that double down on the poisoning of their lives, their bodies, and shortening their existence. Why? Because of lack of economic opportunity. And they found and they know that people, when you have a choice between putting food on a table and perhaps giving a chance to your child to break the cycle of poverty, you're willing to accept the siting of a polluting facility. But the rule of the politicians is to keep the population poor and desperate. And so one of the things that we saw within the EJ movement is not only do you have to fight against dirty policies and the siting and things that, that basically take advantage of your community's poverty status and can poison and kill you, but we recognize part of that liberation also meant fighting for wages and living wage jobs and jobs that give alternatives so that people, if they're fed well, they're earning well and having alternatives, they don't have to rely upon false pros, uh, promises and or technologies and or facilities and or companies that literally will rob their health and their lives so for the sake that they can put uh, food on their table. So one of the things that we linked up early was the power of labor rights within the environmental rights, the whole systemic, holistic overview and whole approach. When we talk about battling against racism, environmental racism, it is the whole cycle. And it's true yesterday as it is today, because one of the things we find that even with the clean technology and clean revolution, such as the uh, the zero, the, uh, the low emission or uh, clean energy vehicles, uh, the Nissan Leaf plant was built on a uh, plantation plant in a right to work state called Mississippi by Renault uh, uh, Nissan, which one of the things about them is that uh, the facility there, oh my goodness, I see 10 minutes is going on. I, I apologize, but I'll, I'll wrap it up here. And one of the things that we found there is that uh, even with the current fight for climate and climate change, uh, you know, that even still right now, even the clean energy solutions are finding their fault along the desperate needs and exploitation of our people of color and thereby putting a plant that's going to be producing a car that would save the planet by a, a clean energy vehicle, but 
on an institution taking advantage of institutional racism that basically pays our workers less than $15 an hour. And so being there to fight for those issues and lifting those up is part of the broader emancipation of the environmental movement. And I apologize. Uh, I, I had to cut basically a, a, a one hour presentation down to about 10 minutes, but uh, we will probably pick it up in some of the questions. Thank you, Paul. Yes, thank you, Aaron, for that wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, and we want to get to our next presenter who will pick up that torch uh, in, in, in passing it over to Brother Willie Terry, who is a trustee of the Troy Area Labor Council, a retiree from the CSEA Union, Local 690, and definitely an outstanding leader within the labor movement here, uh, not only in New York, but nationally as one of the leaders within the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. And he's going to talk to us about uh, some of the things that labor has done to contribute to the fight. And as you heard Aaron mention, the fight for workers and the fight uh, to get uh, wages raised in the fight for 15. These are some of the things that CBTU and some of our local leaders here in New York like Willie Terry, are engaged in. And uh, it's so good to have him here with our program today. Hi, Willie. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hey, thank you, Paul. Uh, you said it all, Paul. <laughs> you said it all. Uh, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that uh, Today, I'm here to talk about uh, one of the groups that involved in this uh, fight against uh, environmental racism, and that's uh, the Coalition of Black Trade Unions. But I want to say that my name is Willie Terry, and I'm a member of the Capital District Coalition of Black Trade Unions, and our president is uh, Shana, Shana Davis. Now, we are uh, national in scope and we are international in our membership. Uh, we have chapters throughout the US and Canada and our work around the subject matter that's being discussed is nationwide under our CARAT team, which stands for Community Action and Response Toxic. And our CARAT team is led by our project director, uh, Carolyn Bell, and our executive director, uh, Peyton M. Wilkinson, uh, who couldn't be here today. Uh, so I'm uh, standing for him. Uh, many uh, low income communities and people of color suffer a disproportionate burden of environmental hazards and, and the various health problems associated with poor air quality, water, and toxic exposure. Often these communities are also victim of environmental racism and discriminatory enforcement of environmental laws and regulations, resulting in high rates of uh, disease, birth defects, and sometimes early death. Now, the Coalition of Black Trade Unions is part of the growing environmental justice movement that empower community-based organizations to identify harmful or discriminatory conditions and also mobilize their constituents and resolve local environmental health problems. Well, in 1998, uh, the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, uh, we initiated an environmental action strategy. And uh, several of our uh, chapters uh, formed the Community Action and Response uh, Against Toxic Team, which is known as CARAT, which along with other safety and environmental allies, uh, we use to help educate and monitor issues such as illegal waste dumping and hauling in the poor communities. And I want to say that, uh, let's stop here, that <clears throat> the carrier teams that we have, these teams are comprised of trade unionists, 
uh, effective residents, environmental justice uh, advocates, legislators, community leaders, scientists, and other persons of interest in a collective environmental health protection effort. And I'm talking about the uh, CBTU because CBTU is one of the uh, longest labor groups that have been working on this particular issue. And they've been around since 1972. Now, what do the CARI team do? Well, what we do, we organize grassroots community rallies, marches, demonstrations. We serve as a liaison between community-based minority groups and environmental advocate organizations and agencies. And we access the needs of communities and hope and him to help to propose uh, some solution. And we provide environmental hazard information uh, to those agencies that need to know what is happening in our particular community. Now, uh, one thing uh, that we uh, do also is that we host, uh, we have a conf national conference every year. And at that conference, we also have as part of our conference, uh, uh, environmental uh, justice uh, part of that. And, uh, what we do, we uh, talk about different things that are going on in the various communities because of our outreach. And uh, those conferences are well attended by our, our membership. But what I do wanna say is that this, all this gonna go, gonna continue as long as we uh, don't uh, really get out there and fight it. And uh, I think what we have to do is what Frederick Douglass said, he said that we have to struggle. And he said that if there is no struggle, there is no progress. So uh, I want to say that uh, we of the Coalition of Black Trade Unions will uh, unite and continue to fight with anybody who wants to work with us. So Paul, I just want to say I, I will answer maybe some questions in the, in the, in, in the question part. Absolutely. And thank you so much brother Willie Terry of CBTU and uh, for being here with us this evening. And, and yes, I got to talk to uh, Peyton earlier today and uh, he had some uh, familial uh, obligations tonight to take care of uh, celebrating uh, his uh, anniversary. Uh, but um, he definitely said that he intends to be here in the future and I know we also have a link to uh, cbtu.org and uh, the carrot team. So that way, if folks would like to get information, I know that Gabby's gonna put that link in the chat so you can find out more about uh, the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists. And as Willie said, it's an international uh, organization, but that's uh, headed by a great New Yorker uh, the Reverend Terry Melvin of the New York State AFL-CIO and uh, Willie and I are both members of the Capital District uh, chapter of the CBTU, which is headed by uh, Shauna Davis. And Willie, thank you so much. And we're definitely going to get some questions to you in a moment. But first, we want to get to one of our other uh, panel uh, presenters here today, uh, Sophia Longsworth. And to just ask her the question of what attracted you to uh, get engaged in the environmental movement and why are you here with us tonight to pass on some of that knowledge to others? Thank you, Paul, good question. So what attracted me to this movement? Well. I mentioned the South Bronx. The South Bronx um, is home to a lot of environmental injustices. And that was the first place I lived when I moved to New York. So I did see um, these issues firsthand. I did breathe in that dirty air for five years. And um, it, it was, it was, it's unjust, you know, it's not fair that the community members, the people who reside in these areas who do not benefit from, let's say, the, the delivery trucks driving through their neighborhoods daily, for example, 
there's the Fresh Direct warehouse located in the South Bronx. And for those of you who don't know, Fresh Direct is a food delivery service. Um, these delivery trucks drive through the Bronx every day making hundreds of trips to more affluent neighborhoods where um, those community members are more able to afford um, the prices of this delivery service. However, the community members who live there who don't rely on this service as much or who may not be able to afford the service as much as others, they're the ones who have to breathe in the dirty air as a result of um, the warehouse being situated there. So that's just, that was probably one of the first things that infuriated me about the South Bronx and environmental injustice. So if you ask, if you want to know like what attracted me to it, it was being probably fortunately placed in that situation so that my eyes could be opened to environmental injustices here in New York City and then learning a little bit more about it throughout the states. You know, we mentioned the lead in the pipes in um, upstate New York, the Black and Latino children being more likely to be um, poisoned by lead than their other counterparts. And that's why I'm here. And that's what I'm going to work towards, uh, an environmentally just uh, society and a society where we don't have any toxics in our environment and um, children are free and safe to grow up in a healthy society. Wow, thank you so much for that. And that's a, 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 a great uh, response and really just shows your passion and why uh, we're so proud to have you here at Clean and Healthy New York. And that being said, um, Aaron, um, why don't you talk a little bit about your new role with the Adirondack Council and what you're doing to expose uh, our community uh, to the outdoors and alternatives to being cooped up inside? Aaron, my, apolo my apologies. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's actually a blessing uh, to actually finally advocate uh, in this space. Uh, people of color are, no, are not new to the outdoors. In fact, when we do land recognitions in honor of the First Nations whose lands have been taken as a part of the creation of the United States of America, a second thing that we also need to get in the habit of doing is people recognition, which are the forced nations of Africa who were enslaved to so-called cut, shape, put in roads, and build the infrastructure that to this day, uh, this nation has come to depend upon, but also the founding capitalism. So I happen to be blessed to work in the Adirondacks of upstate New York. And um, I, as I said, not new. My fact, we travel every year to our family homelands that we've owned since we were enslaved. My daughter is there, Olivia, sixth generation free on land that we've had since emancipation. And I'm standing there with the uh, with what we call Caesar's Head Mountain uh, behind me. My ancestors in 1842 were the five-star field guides and staff who took naturalists all around to see the flora and fauna and that finding medicinal plants and herbs. So our people have always historically been connected to uh, 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 the outdoors. And so uh, doing this job now with the uh, Forever Adirondacks campaign is not only focusing in on the crisis and the need to preserve wilderness because we need to do uh, a new green new deal to put people to protect the wilderness because it's our biggest natural carbon sink rather than investing tens of billions in uh, what they call carbon sequestration plants. People don't realize that in any plant that they can build and of existing technology what it what they can sequester in carbon in manu manufacturing facilities in 30 uh, 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 days the or Adirondacks and places like the Adirondacks and its forests can do literally in about an hour. So we already have the carbon sequestration plants. Now is connecting the people to the outdoors and the wilderness and the new jobs to be employed in this place and space and in this and empowering this technology so that they can a not only be part of the climate uh, solution with regards to protecting wilderness and forests, but also regaining and recapturing the history that many of us uh, since we were enslaved have been, you know, have been land stewards. Uh, so right now, working in the Adirondack, making sure it's a welcoming and inviting place and space, 
but also pushing right now the governor to create the new opportunities of 20 uh, first century jobs with regards to planet protection and climate protection and making sure that our communities are also prepared and ready to take part of those jobs and take part of those new economic opportunities. So as I share with you from that slide with my daughter and my family, it's literally going back to the future for me. All right, Aaron, there is a question for you um, and uh, from the audience and it's a, uh, um, the question is, uh, given your experience, how have your views evolved with regards to making lasting progress and getting beyond fighting the same fights over and over? Well, the point is, is that that's what resistance is about. It's, it's the long struggle. Uh, the civil rights movement, as we can see, has never stopped. You know, it's, it's, it comes in waves, it comes in setbacks. We right now see what the current majority uh, that controls the, scene, the Supreme Court uh, they're what they call strict textualist constitutionalists. Let me tell you what that means elementally. These are people who believe that the Constitution as it's written is unchangeable. So in the eyes of somebody strict textualists, still of a human being. So the against, against racism and as it was charted in our Constitution of the country, that battle never stops. And that's at the national level. We see that that onslaught begins. In fact, it was what drove and still drives the power of the Republican Party and, and Donald Trump. The only thing is now the mask is off and they're saying and living the, mask, the silent part out loud. So our struggles at the grassroots level for fighting for environmental justice and all of the facets and making sure that we have our rights equally protected under the law, that battle never ends. Uh, so the question is more or less is that what do you do to recharge? What do you do to reconnect? How do you recharge yourself from an ongoing uh, perpetual struggle that ebbs and flows? Well, that's where my family, my network of friends, brothers and sisters like here with Clean and Healthy New York, um, reinforcing that we're not alone, but we have much more work to do. But sharing that work and sharing that love and sharing that responsibility, your attention and participating and listening to us, hearing the old story, the long story, but how the past is not new again. Uh, and, and taking in that knowledge and walking away with that it's going to be very critical. So the issue is, is that, you know, I am just the latest generation. I stand up on the generation of civil rights activists, labor rights activists, like my father and my family, and uh, those who went before me. You saw that slide. My ancestors have literally been at the forefront of various civil rights battles, you know, since, you know, the founding of this nation and since our people were enslaved. So the answer at the end of the day is that it's a duty and a responsibility, because if we do not stand, then they come for our children, they come for our neighbors, as well as come for the rest of what's left for our planet. So we must stand in solidarity if we're going to save humanity. In order to save this planet, we must enlist humanity. To save humanity, we must work in collaboratively together, transforming and transcending racism, sexism, and homophobia, all those divisive tools that they use to divide us so they can, they can maintain hegemony and be on top. These are the things that we must be constructed to build a strong uh, environmental movement, environmental justice movement, but recognize our place is every place on this planet. All right, thank you so much, Brother Aaron. And then we have another question, and this question is for Willie Terry, and that is, how will the issue of environmental justice be addressed? And equally important, how can we achieve greater awareness of the issue in our various communities? And I know I've been on enough protest lines with you, uh, Willie, and marches, uh, that I know you, you've got this question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you know, Aaron, Aaron has said a lot, you know, and I'm listening to him and, you know, in my mind, it says, those are the things that I would like to say that he's saying. But one thing I want to say is that, that, that I'm a labor person and, and labor, you know, organizing is, is one of the key uh, areas that we are working in. Uh, one of the key things that keep us going. And if we're going to build this movement, I think it got to be like Dr. King uh, was building the poor people movement. He was getting labor and the community and the community and civil rights group together to build a mass movement. Well, that's what we're going to have to do in order to uh, 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 continue this movement and, and continue this fight because of the people who are uh, uh, against us or, or the people who are polluting uh, or, or messing up the environment, uh, they, are, they are organized. But 
the community can't deal with them just per se. So labor who have who know organizing is the one that have to be out there uh, coalescing with the community and raising the uh, political issues about what is happening. And hopefully, you know, we could build this mass movement. So we have to build a mass movement. It can't be a, a individual a organization, a person, a group. It will have to be a mass movement. And that means that everything that we do, you know, have to be, we build locally, we build individually. Our overall goal is that it, we are building this towards building a mass movement. Okay. Thank you so much, Willie, uh, for that wonderful answer. And yes, we are working uh, to build uh, this movement. Uh, you know, we at Clean and Healthy New York believe in coalitions and we're a part of two uh, of, of mighty uh, environmental coalitions in the state of New York. One being the Just Green Partnership and the other being the Lead Free Kids Coalition of New York. And with that, um, one of the last, we want to remind our viewers that they can raise their hands or throw questions in the chat. As some of you have done, thank you so much. Um, want to ask, uh, Sophia, what are some of the things coming up that Clean and Healthy uh, might want to have uh, our viewers and the public know about and come and participate with us in? Yes, Paul, thank you. So um, like I mentioned in the beginning, we would like you all to join us in some of our action steps. And we will be having advocacy days coming up. Our next advocacy day is on Wednesday, February 16th, and that will be remote. So at the end um, of the webinar, or maybe we can just put the slide up with the information for that, um, you can join us on Wednesday the 16th for our advocacy day. We're also having our Earth Day Advocacy Day in April. There we go. So we have our Just Green Advocacy Day next Wednesday. It's remote. We're also having one in March. That's on Tuesday, March 15th, the Lead Free Kids New York Advocacy Day. And of course, the Earth Day Advocacy Day, Tuesday, April 26th. So the first two will be held remotely um, with everything changing with regards to COVID. We're not entirely certain whether uh, the advocacy day in April will be remote in person or um, a hybrid event, but we will keep you posted to let you all know. And um, Bobby has put a link in the chat if you want to follow along so that you can register for these events and get involved with us and our coalitions. Thanks so much, uh, Sophia, for that. And really thank you to all of our participants, our viewers, and all of our um, panelists here tonight as well. And, you know, we've got five minutes left in this evening's program and everything, and wanted to give all of our uh, panelists an opportunity to uh, uh, say one more last uh, closing statement and we'll we'll start with Willie and uh Willie you've got one minute and then we'll go to Aaron and we'll have a uh, Sophia and then uh our executive director Bobby Wilding close us out. Go ahead Willie Hey, Will, are you still with us, or? Will, he's on mute. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I'm sorry about that. That's no, all right. Go ahead, Will. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, definitely uh, the Coalition of Black Trade Unions, we will work uh, with you on those uh, advocate days because that's uh, one of the uh, key areas that we work around, you know. So we definitely will be working with you or anybody who, who's uh, dealing with this issue, particular issue. Uh and I would uh, uh, advise people to, uh, if they have other things going on in the community in terms of environmental racism, uh, to contact the, C the local CBTU chapter. And uh, you could get that by going online at uh, cbtu.org. 
All right. All right. Thank you so much for that. And next, uh, Aaron. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And, and, and Paul and uh, Bobby, thank you. Uh, and CHNY, you know, to, you know, again, lift up the program, the message, and but more importantly, the work that you all have been doing, which has been critical. All of this work comes together to save and protect not only our communities, but to protect human health and the environment. You know, we have some very, 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 very powerful enemies that are out there. Uh, there are those who have a vision of America, humanity, our natural resources, our very communities that basically comes down to their bottom line and to their shareholders. But to us as a people and as a community, the very lives and connections of family, neighbors, and friends are much more dear to us. And the degradation of the environment that puts our lives at wealth risk and everything around us at risk is a price that's too high to pay. I urge every one of you that are taking advantage of listening to us go on about the history and, and, and the threats and risks and the future of environmental justice, look in your pockets right now, things that you can do right now, support and lift up and invest in entities like Clean and Healthy New York. As a board member, I'm saying your dollars spent here, your dollars invested here, your dollars supporting here lifts up some of the most important public policy and legacy work that we need to engage in this is one of many fronts and many fights that we, you know, we have to, as I say, take on the big polluters, but it's not the only one. You know, we have various organizations that are dealing with things from wilderness to climate, but at the end of the day, your first step, the most important step begins with an action and commitment. We've taken and you've given us your attention this evening, and I just hope to inspire you to connect with us to support Clean and Healthy New York in the work that we have to do going forward with regards to protecting human health protecting your health, protecting New Yorkers' health, and saying, together, we can do this. So in solidarity, the most important thing I can ask of you is to engage. Engage as if your life depends upon it, because it does. All right, we, and we thank you so much. And, and yes, uh, we do appreciate uh, all of the comments that you've said, Aaron, and your participation, uh, not only as a panelist, but all of your work for the environmental movement and as a board member for us here at Clean and Healthy New York. And to, to give a closing comment uh, to her participation, uh, Sophia Longsworth. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Erin. So I'll just build on that. Um, engage in the work that we're doing. Learn about what's happening in your communities. Get motivated and start to take some action steps we can overcome the issues that we have unfortunately been facing for far too long. We can have a just and toxic free society for the future. We just need to learn about it and work at it. So thank you all for joining us. Yes, and thank you so much, Sophia. And to close us out this evening, uh, as I introduce once again, our executive director, Bobby Wilding, I just wanna thank you all for being a part of this intersections, race and the environmental policy. Uh, and on behalf of uh, the other staff here at Clean and Healthy New York, thank you so much. And to thank you behind the scenes, uh, Gabrielle Gonzalez, one of our program uh, associates uh, for her work in helping to put this together, the slides and all of the other things that help make this uh, flawless. Bobby, take it away. Thanks so much, Paul. And, you know, I just want to echo all of the gratitude for um, all of your, your wisdom and your knowledge that you shared with us, Aaron and Willie and Sophia. And thank you, Paul, for moderating and Gabby for doing all the tech work behind the scenes. We are recording this and we will be posting it up on our YouTube website. We'll send you a follow-up email that will include the link. So if you want to share it with uh, other friends or colleagues or family members, uh, we encourage you to do so to help spread the word. And I really do hope you'll consider uh, coming to our advocacy days. Um, if you haven't done it before, it can seem intimidating, but it 
I promise you it's really not. We make it super easy to uh, get your voice heard by people who are making decisions about New York state policy. Um, and we wanna support you in, in that activism. Um, and so just to stay tuned, we will be continuing this webinar series. Um, the next one will be on March 15th at 7 p uh, March 15th at 7 p.m. Um, and we'll be talking about the impact of toxic chemicals on women uh, in honor of Women's History Month. We'll be doing a, a following one in uh, April as a preview for Earth Day, Advocacy Day, and uh, continuing on throughout the year. So we really appreciate your support for these webinar series and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much for coming and have a great night.